Hi everyone, I'm Jo Field. I'm the moderator for this next session on the future of urban mobility. So I am the founder and managing director of JFG Communications. We are a public affairs and stakeholder engagement consultancy that specialises in transport and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We're working with a number of clients in the sustainable transport and future mobility space. I'm also a board member of Women in Transport, a trustee of Living Streets, and a council member of the Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation. So lots of coming at this debate with lots of different perspectives. We have an expert panel joining us today. So I'm going to introduce you to all the panel members. On my left here, we have Will Butler-Adams, OBE. He is the Chief Executive of Brompton Bicycle. Will joined Brompton in 2002. He became a director in 2006 and took over as Managing Director in 2008. Over that period, the company has grown from a 2 million turnover with 27 staff to a company with a turnover of over 30 million with over 250 staff. Will is passionate about all things engineering. He has worked for Nissan, ICI, DuPont and Brompton and has been involved in product development, R&D, project management and manufacturing excellence. He studied mechanical engineering at Newcastle University and is a chartered mechanical engineer. On Will's in the middle, even, we have Alan Clark. Alan is the Director of Government Affairs for the UK, Ireland and Nordics at Lyme, based in London. Before beginning the role in autumn 2018, Alan worked in Uber's public policy team for three and a half years. Before entering the tech sector, Alan worked in politics for several years, including in the UK Parliament and on election campaigns in the UK and the USA. Alan is a graduate of the University of Manchester and he also holds a Master's in Public Policy from the University of Oxford. And then we have Caroline Sampan Sampanaro, Head of Micromobility Policy at Lyft. Caroline joined Lyft in 2018 to start the company's new bike, scooter and pedestrian policy program. In this new role, Caroline will lead efforts to form strong partnerships with cities on policy initiatives like Vision Zero and complete street redesigns, as well as help realise specific goals around bike and scooter shared mobility. Before Lyft, Caroline spent two months at Urfo and before that, 12 years as Deputy Director of Transportation Alternatives in New York City. At Transult, Caroline led the advocacy campaign to bring Vision Zero to the United States. She established the country's largest bike share program called City Bike and set national standards for urban complete street design. In 2013, in partnership with traffic violence victims, Caroline founded Families for Safe Streets which is a grassroots, victim-led movement to eradicate reckless driving. It now has chapters or branches in cities across the United States, and Caroline holds a BA in Anthropology from Columbia University. Okay, to kick off the topic, I'm going to ask each panel member to just give us a five minute introduction to the, their company and their vision for the future of urban transport and mobility. So I'm going to hand over to Will first. Okay. Um, so we make a little bike, which you can see on the right there. Um, it's designed to make living a little bit better, particularly in cities. We made about 600,000 of them to date. Um, we sell them across the world through 1,500 shops in 47 countries, but really we're selling to the cities in those countries rather than the countries. I spent 17 years pootling around cities on my Brompton, having a blast. And I've seen and learned a lot as a result of that. And my observation is that for 50 years we've created an environment where now most of us live, which is the city, which isn't really making us happy. We have mental and physical health problems that just 
don't need to be there. So, I mean, I was a bit of a weirdo, six foot four on a bike with small wheels, for quite a long time. And the lovely thing is I'm becoming less of a weirdo and more normal, which is great. Because it means that the awareness of the, the madness of what we've created for our citizens is becoming held and observed by more people. And it isn't that difficult. What we need to do is fairly flipping obvious. We have stuffed our cities full of square boxes, which are cluttering them. Well, we can get shot of those for starters, because you know, they're taking up space that we need for people, families, children. Um, and occasionally they belch out a bit of nasty stuff, but actually most of the time they're sitting there doing nothing, just sort of taking up precious space. So we've got to get shot of those. They can, they can all sit around the outside and we can use them when we need to go off into the hills. Um, and it's no good digging a few more tunnels under the city, in my humble opinion. You know, we've dug another recent tunnel in the UK. It's costing us about 25 billion. Um, and, and my observation is, when you stick somebody under the ground where it's dark and crappy, um, <laughs> it, it, um, it makes them miserable. Um, and miserable in their head. And miserable in their soul. And it's not allowing them to do what they should do, which is observe their city, observe the architecture, feel the seasons, get on their feet, move about. And ironically, the little bicycle has been around for a very long time, and we don't need to reinvent it. We might fiddle around with it and make it fold, but fundamentally, it's pretty damn good. And we should be doing a bit more of that and doing a bit more walking and making people feel safer, doing a bit more movement, because we're designed to move. So that's what we are trying to do. We're trying to innovate. We've recently launched an electric bike because in London, 98% of people know how to ride a bike, but only 4% of people are. So what the hell do we need to do with the 94% of the people who know how to ride a bike and you're paying money to go down in that dark little tunnel? We need to get them out. So if we can put a bit of zoom into their bike and then they go, woo, and enjoy it, then great, get them back out. So. We, we are working hard, trying to use material science, we've got a bike class scheme, we're trying to try everything to get more people moving and cycling in their cities. Right, well, um, nice to meet you all. My name's Alan, I'm from Lyme. Um, like a, um, as I was introduced, I run our public policy in the UK, Ireland and Nordics. Um, and the simplest way of describing what we do, we're an electric micro-mobility company operating all around the world. And fundamentally, we try to provide people with things that, in Will's words, make them go, woo, when they're going around the city. So for us, that means electric bikes and electric scooters. And we offer these in about 100 cities um, around the world. And building on a lot of what Will said, which, to be honest, um, I can't find much to disagree with in there. So we might be quite a short panel in that regard. Um, but in terms of kind of, for us, the question is, how do you provide the solutions, again, like we were saying, for those 97% of people who can ride a bike or who want to travel around a city in a different way but currently don't? And one of the ways in which we think we can do that is by providing um, a cost-effective, safe, enjoyable and accessible means of travelling. So in London, we have um, around about 1,500 uh, electric bikes out on the streets at the moment. You can, you can see them around the place. They're, they're bright green, lime green, so they're easy to spot. Um, and they've been on the streets for about uh, just under 12 months now. We operate in and have agreements with seven London boroughs to put those bikes out. Um, and you can hire and rent them through your phone using a smartphone app. Um, and already in London over the last kind of year, we've done upwards of half a million journeys of them, or people in London have done upwards of half a million journeys on them. So what we think is we've got a solution here um, that people want to use, that lots of people seem to like using, um, that's good for the environment, it's good for people's health, um, but crucially, that doesn't come at a cost to the city. Like Will said, you know, London's spending 25 billion building a tunnel underneath to increase transport capacity. Um, when we talk about repurposing cities and repurposing space, that comes at cost to local authorities, it comes at cost to national governments, ultimately it comes at cost to you guys as taxpayers. Um, our scheme, requires maybe a little bit of work with the cities to make sure there's some, some bike infrastructure in place and the, the streets are safe for people to ride and they're safe for people to use electric scooters in some parts of the world, but it doesn't come at any other cost to the city. We, we take all that ourselves, we manufacture a product, make a product, provide it in a way that we hope the general public will want to use. And our goal moving forward is to try and um, expand the services that we offer, 
uh, work with cities and governments to make sure that they are managed in a way that means that people who want to use them can have a great time, find them accessible, find them affordable, but they don't negatively impact people who don't want to use a bike or an electric scooter and don't unnecessarily that keen on them being around in the city. Um, yeah, and obviously the long-term goal for us is to provide these types of things with the ultimate goal of removing cars and making cities more livable. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, has anyone used a Lyft or engaged with a Lyft app before? We're not in, in Europe, so I'm just curious, show of hands. Very few. Um, so, um, as Joe mentioned, I joined Lyft uh, last year to help them move away from their core business, which is ride sharing, shared rides in a vehicle, um, into shared micromobility rides. Um, and you know, Lyft's mission is, is pretty simple. It's to work with cities to provide the world's best transportation. Um, some, some quick stats on the United States, um, where I'm from. There are eight parking spots for every single car in the United States. That amounts to a $200 billion a year subsidy for drivers. Um, more than 70% of Americans drive alone in their car to work. This is a massive crisis uh, for the economy and just for cities and, and, and places. And it's not Americans' fault, right? Uh, most of the country has actually been built, I know, I'm a, has been built for the automobile. We spent a century building our lives around the automobile in the United States. And so as we look for solutions, um, what is now, I think, not so uncommon, rideshare, um, when, when Lyft started, it really was this idea that you could hop in, a, in someone's car and share it with them. Um, was a radical concept, especially for Americans who like to drive alone. Um, but it's obviously an incomplete solution. And as we think about unlocking sort of the potential for happier cities, cities where more people can live, that are fair, that are affordable, we have to think about getting people out of cars. And so um, on the Lyft platform now, in the cities where we operate um, bikes and scooters, you can uh, surface real-time public transportation information. You can unlock a shared bike, a shared scooter, or you can continue to use our uh, rideshare option. Last year, we acquired Motivate, which is um, was the United States' largest bike share operator. Um, so Lyft is now effectively the largest bike share operator in the United States, which is a really exciting thing. Um, we operate City Bike in New York City. Um, Bay Wheels in the Bay Area, Divi in Chicago, the list goes on. Um, and, and something really exciting has happened for me as someone that's worked on bike advocacy for all of my career. Um, you know, I think we're making bike share available to, in this case, Americans that have never thought about biking before. So when we started surfacing City Bike in our Lyft app, we broke ridership records week after week after week over the last four months. Um, just last week, we actually started servicing bike lanes in the Lyft app so that when you're riding around in the city, you can start to actually experience your city streets in a new way. Um, the influence of adding bikes and scooters into the business has also been, I think, significant for the entire business. So um, if you're riding in a Lyft rideshare car right now as a passenger, we're pushing you notifi notifications to remind you to look when you open your door. Um, we actually have adopted the Dutch, Dutch Reach uh, concept and have started um, telling Americans about that notion, which is obviously something that makes total sense, but most people are not familiar with. Um, and so we're sort of making good on our commitment to help cities, um, again, build streets for, for more than just vehicles. Mm -hmm. So some fundamental pillars that we're building all of our bike scooter businesses around are access to public transit. So in, in cities where we operate, you can use your public transit card to unlock your bike or your scooter. Um, we're surfacing real-time public transportation in the app to try and show people that it's sometimes more cost-effective and faster to actually use public transit instead of one of our options. We're also focused on transportation equity. Um, bike share systems in the U.S. to date have been built largely in central business districts, leaving large, um, normally lower income communities out. So one of the first things we did when we bought Motivate is we worked with the city of New York, for example, to put together a $100 million investment to expand City Bike to low-income communities that had been underserved by City Bike to date. Um, in Chicago, we, we made a $50 million commitment to expand Divi, that bike share system, <laughs> citywide, serving large low-income neighborhoods that have been left out of that system to date. Um, and the same thing in the Bay Area. So 
Um, and you know, last but not least, um, I think is safety, right? And, and thinking about the role that a company like Lyft can play as cities are looking to re redesign streets um, to make the tough choices of taking parking away and putting a bike lane down instead. We've been joining with advocates on the ground in the cities where we operate to use our political muscle to make sure those projects get done and get done fast. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now we're going to move on to questions. As the moderator, it's my prerogative to ask the first questions. So before we open it to the floor, I'm going to ask a, a different question to each of the panel members. I'm going to start with Caroline. How can private sector operators best work with cities to achieve their mobility goals? And is there anything you'd want to see change in these relationships? Yeah, I think, oh, I think it's just working yeah. no. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Um, it, so I'll, I'll speak again from the US perspective because that's, that's where I've been working. Um, you know, right now the, the, the debate around micromobility is very much one of regulation. How do we control these scooters? How do we corral these bikes? How do we make sure that those scooter riders, uh, you know, don't kill and maim people walking? Which is, I think, you know, is a very familiar, for me, conversation. It's what we heard a lot about when bicycling became more mainstream as a form of transportation in cities, those reckless rogue riders. Um, so I think it's actually in, in part framing. Um, you know, one of the best things about the last year for me has been the partnerships we have with cities like New York, Chicago, San Francisco around bike share. Those are 10 year plus contracts. Um, they allow us to think long term and to work carefully and slowly and consistently with our city partners as a private company to achieve longer term goals. On the flip side of that, there's the scooter regulatory environment where we are operating in, in 20 plus cities in the US. And those are often six month time horizons, 12 month time horizons. The, the tone and tenor is very much, um, you know, we're gonna cap you here, we're gonna reduce your speed there, we're gonna make you do X, Y, and Z. And, and while I get that, because ultimately what we're dealing with is like really competing for very limited space, mostly taken by cars, and the cities are really not thinking beyond that, we have to change that paradigm. And I actually think the, Micromobility context because we can implement it so quickly as a solution is a great forum for public private partnership to innovate um, and, and, and I think we can model um, I, I'm eager to model a lot of those relationships on the ones that we have in some of our biggest bike share systems and again I think the long-term time horizon um, allows a public and a private sector partner to start to to sort of take some risks to trust one another to think a little bit more like the other. When you're, when you're dealing in such short terms, I think it, it's really tough to do that. You, even, you know, to get into a rhythm with a, with a partner usually takes a year. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, that's where my head's at lately. Thank you, Caroline. Now I have a question for Alan. What does the future of London's transport look like in your view? <laughs> Uh, so I think maybe it's a good idea to say this is kind of a longer term thing. Um, obviously things can take a little bit of time to come to fruition. But I mean, I think, look, you've all come to a day that's entitled Car Free Day. So the answer is probably somewhat in the title in that, in that respect. I think for us, we basically think that, you know, vehicles have got a, are useful in some circumstances within cities. There are some cases when you have to use one and it's unavoidable. Um, but those cases are an absolute fraction of the current vehicle use today. I don't think... Presumably, nobody in the room would disagree with that. Um, otherwise, kind of, perhaps this is a different event than you're expecting. Um, but yeah, so for us, we, we, we think that the future in London certainly is has to be a mix of um, sustainable, probably um, electric mobility options, similar to that that we offer, but also mixed into other services, private bicycle use, um, hire schemes, and also, you know, public transport is still going to remain remain the central part of this. So the big question for companies like ours, and you know, and city governments all around the world, is how do you make sure that new forms of mobility link into public transport in a sustainable and, and clever way? Um, we've got some really interesting data from both London but other cities around Europe, um, whereby it's exactly as you would imagine. When you put, when we put a scooter or a bike out on the streets, 
Um, and one of the main ways people use that is to go and ride it to a tube station and leave it at the tube station, or get one from the tube station and ride it home. But of course they do. It's an entirely natural way that people would want to use that type of service. People often don't want, to, don't want to cycle eight miles across London, but they might do a mile at each end and ride the tube for the rest of it, or whatever. Um, so the question then becomes, well, can we look at a sustainable way in which companies like ours, or Lyft in the US, or whomever, can work with cities to make sure that when that person gets out of the underground, a bike can be there in a place they know where it's going to be, and when they ride to the underground in the morning, they've got some certainty they've got a place to leave an e-bike or an electric scooter, um, and they can do that in a way that doesn't negatively impact anyone else, but makes it the natural choice for them. And until we make things the natural, um, clean modes of transport, the natural choice for people, people will still use taxis, cars, rideshare, whatever, to go around the city, and ultimately we don't think that is in the future of London, we don't think it's really in the future of, of many cities. Um, so, roundabout way of saying, not very many cars, lots of other forms of transport, and also I think it's a really exciting time to be in this area and be interested in it, because now, for the first time in a little while, we have, you know, really sizable players in the market investing huge amounts of money to get this thing, these types of things right. You know, Lyft is not a small company, um, Lime's a kind of decent sized company. There are other very big companies investing in new solutions, um, you know, to get, to get more people onto these types of schemes. And when you put that alongside the work that companies like Prompton have done, I think it's an exciting time and I think we should be optimistic and if we can get it right, um, there's a chance here that we can really make some improvement. Thanks, Alan. And now a question for Will. Will, is change happening fast enough? <laughs> well, that's an obvious, obvious question, isn't it? It isn't. <coughs> I think we need to be a bit careful to jump up and down and, and get overly obsessed with going on about how things aren't happening fast enough. What we need to be doing is doing. That is the key. Um, we need to be doing the most we can. We need to be affecting change in whatever way we can. We need to be contributing. And change is a funny thing because when you look at it in the moment, it never feels like it's going fast enough. But when you look back, you feel you've achieved something. And we can't be pointing the finger everywhere about what we should or shouldn't be doing and how much faster we should be going. We've got to be doing. And the, the incredible thing, because I've been watching this industry for quite a long time, is how it has shifted from being very, very in the extreme to being very, very both politically interesting and commercially interesting. I mean, the sort of turmoil that has gone on in the last five years with the emergence of OFA and Mobike, which are completely bonkers and, and turned out to be unsustainable, but sort of good bonkers, because it's just disruption. I mean, who would have thought two billion dollars raised and then it's all turned up and then we're all, our industry's finished and then they fizzled out and then, you know, you guys have rocked up and there's 50 million jumping into one city and it's another, it's great. Is it all gonna be right? Is it all gonna go, some of it's gonna go a bit pear-shaped? Yes, but, you know, we need a bit of this. We need a bit of this shaking up because what we have has to change and we do have to do things and we have to make mistakes and we have to try all sorts of weird stuff. But for an industry that's sort of been stagnated for 50 years, this is, as you say, it's pretty exciting stuff. So I think the answer is, of course, not fast enough, but we don't need to get fixated on that. We need to, in every way, agitate and do as much as we can, as fast as we can. Thanks, Will. Now it's your turn, everyone in the audience. So what I would like is try and keep it short so, and proper questions rather than comments. Also say your name and where you're from. If you want to direct a question at a particular panel member, then please do. Otherwise, I'll ask who wants to take it. And Hamish, if you want to pass the mic around, that would be really helpful. Um, let's go with the guy in the, the blue t-shirt in the middle <coughs> row up here. The short and sweet questions. Hi, Ross Miller from Sushan Scotland, uh, Transport Integration. Uh, it's excellent to hear the good work that's going on, working with the, the, the councils in particular, um, and, and the mention there of uh, trying to avoid any negative impacts uh, for people that aren't using your services. Um, uh, I'm just trying to, to link up uh, on the previous uh, talks we've had about data. What data are you sharing with the local authorities? 
um, and what are you doing to look at uh, repurposing of land use in order to try and avoid some of the pitfalls that we've seen from lights and mobike and the introduction of scooters uh, when they finally come to the UK? And is that to everyone or a particular? Just in general, uh, well, particular to Lyme and Lyft. Uh, okay. Alan? Um, yeah, first of all, it's a really, it's a really good question. I think, like I, like I said, you know, a vital part of everything that we're doing and Lyft are doing and other companies are doing is to work out exactly the questions you say. How can you make sure these, that these types of services become the de facto choice of people, are there when they need them and are accessible um, without negatively impacting other people? And if you can't do that, then the scheme doesn't work, the service doesn't work. So you have to make sure that that remains um, an integral part of it. The way in which we do it is, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of stuff around rider education, a lot of stuff around, you know, lots of these e-scooters, e-bikes, they're new mobility forms. People don't have a lot of experience of using them. Companies have to do more, and we try very hard to educate people on the correct place to park a bike or a scooter so it doesn't block areas. But also, you know, we're engaged in joint advocacy efforts both in the US and in Europe about repurposing space, car parking spaces for cycle parking next to public transport stations, repurposing areas specifically for micro-mobility parking. Um, and we've got some really good examples from cities who have done that. Um, if anyone goes up to Stockholm, Sweden, uh, you'll see on the street marked bays for parking of scooters. And they were put out a couple of months ago. Initially, no one really used them, didn't know what they were for. But now the companies are encouraging people and telling people they're there. People are seeing them around and gradually the numbers of people who are leaving a scooter in the marked bay is going up. Um, the one thing I would say is you also have to look at it in, from a city perspective in the context of, well, this is a problem that is not just about dockless mobility things, bikes, scooters, etc. It is an issue about also how do we use public space. You know, the um, Select Committee and Transport Select Committee in Parliament just published a big report on pavement parking in cities like London. And, you know, it is also an issue about, well, do we really want cars parked halfway across pavements or could we be using that for better options? Um, so, in a roundabout way, I think we want to do more on it and recognise the importance of it. Um, in terms of data sharing, in London at the moment, we have a kind of data dashboard that we share with local authorities who we're signed up with. Um, they can go onto their log on and see everything about our journeys in their borough, number of bikes that are out at any given time, number of, journey, number of rides per day, per week, the routes they were taken. Um, particularly stuff like the routes taken is really interesting because when we build up a picture of a city over time, we can then identify areas where the cycling infrastructure is rubbish and because people go around it. Um, and that can be really useful. Cities normally know that, but if they want to use it in a targeted way, that can be really interesting. So, yeah. yeah, I would just add, I worked at OFO for a couple months, so I mean, one of the, the, the during the darkness boom, the big pitch that the companies were making to cities was, it's you don't have to spend any money, you don't have to take any space. Um, if we're gonna make micromobility <laughs> compete with automobile use in a real way, we have to spend money and we have to take space. Um, if cities' core budgets aren't changing to reflect the prioritization of micromobility, micromobility will not be prioritized by city governments. This is sort of, I think, basic stuff. Um, and, and actually, our, mo our most successful markets are markets where the cities we're working with actually are spending city dollars to make space for bike share. Um, and, and, you know, so I think that public-private partnership is key. Of course, turning the data over to the cities is very important, we do that, but um, more than that, I think we have to surface the demand and actually show the larger public that this is a priority over car use by literally physically taking the space, which is why at Lyft, we actually, um, you know, we acquired Motivate for a reason. They, they have a dock-based approach to bike share. Um, I'm not convinced that dockless in its true form would ever really work at scale. Um, you know, public transit works for a reason. It's predictable, it's reliable, you know where to go. If we're gonna make micromobility work at a scale, Comper may be familiar with um, the North American Association for Transporta City Transportation Officials um, produced a micromobility report recently and they, they uncovered a couple really interesting things. The first is that um, you know, while we saw in the U.S. scooter use, like in, on the raw numbers side, just soar, you know, so popular, no doubt about it, unquestionable, more than bike share. Um, what we didn't see, like we saw with docked bike share, was a network effect playing out. So as the number of scooters in cities has increased and the just raw numbers of trips has increased, 
That hasn't translated to an increase in trips per scooter per day. On the docked bike share side of things, you're seeing a footprint, a footprint of a dock system expand and you're seeing the trips per bike per day go up over time. And so I think what that tells you um, is something's missing on the, on the true dockless side, right? We're not, we're not seeing the stickiness. Um, part of that could be the competitive landscape. You see like a sort of chalk block approach where each operator has a tiny piece of the pie. But I think more importantly, it's, it's that sort of the predictability and reliability of, of placemaking that um, really needs to be there for micromobility to scale. I'll just add a little something to that. Um, what we've seen in our industry was a very unglamorous, sort of is still a bit unglamorous, maybe it's got a bit more glamorous, but, but bike business. And what has happened is suddenly the bike business has become a tech business. And then, of course, all hell breaks loose because it's tech and trendy and you get 200 or $2 billion and we all go gangbusters. Um, but what has happened is that those industries have raised huge amounts of money, but actually what they've implemented has been very low-tech. They've just gone for mass sort of geography grab, and the tech is quite low-tech. So there is so much more that will happen as these businesses mature, because they've hardly had a minute to, to really think about what they're doing. We have been playing and working on bike car for seven years in a completely different way. We don't have the funds, but we have a lot of gray matter and a lot of experience. So we have a system where you pick a bike up from a location, one of our little docks. It's not a city scheme, it's a national scheme. We're in 25 cities. You pick the bike up, it's either in the dock, but you can get 40 bikes in one car parking space, or it's being ridden, or it's inside a building. The average hire is four and a half days. It's not a journey, it, it, it becomes your bike. But there will be solutions. We have to be a bit patient and maybe not overly knock some of the stuff, because you need to knock it a bit because it can upset people, but if you over knock it, you knock it on the head. You need to knock it so you steer it to the solutions because the technology is there. We just there's been such impatience with all this money raising going on that they've slightly gone at it a bit hard, hard and fast, in my opinion. So I think it will come. What we've got at the moment, as you say, isn't quite right, but but there are solutions there, and and we want to be encouraging this investment because it's better than what we've got, even if it's not quite right. Thank you. Okay, another question. This lady here in the green t shirt. Um, I just wanted to raise the issue when you said, oh, sorry. I just wanted to raise the issue when you said that you could use cars for the hills. I'm actually involved in a campaign to stop the Arundel bypass. We don't want cars in the hills. We want the Bronx and bike. It is perfectly possible to ride a bike on the southbound way of Brompton. I go out with people and do so. There is a future for you in selling to rural areas as you, you look at the cities. And one of the things that I'm campaigning for with SCAPE, the South Coast Alliance for Transport and the Environment, is to calm uh, rural lanes so that you don't bump into a 4 by 4 going 50 miles an hour, predictably at 3.30 on the school run. Instead, I'd love to see all those children on your bikes. I realise this is a comment, not a question, but I would like your comments in return. So you're right. Um, we... So our business, if we're being very specific, has a perception of size which is greater than the business itself. So we are getting bigger, but we're still small. It's taken us 40 years to get to sort of 40 million turnover. These businesses here have raised billions in like two years. So we have to focus. We don't have the resource to do everything. And at this moment in time, of course we have customers and there is opportunity outside of cities. There is. I use my bike in, I was pedalling from Bath to London last weekend and I'm feeling a bit delicate in the posterior. <laughs> but, um, so there's plenty of scope and wonderful things to do, but we can't do everything. So our message at the moment is about cities because the impact we can have cities on cities is greater. And that's not ideal. We'd love to do everything, but we can't. And I think... I think if you can, you know, for example, in schools, some work we're trying to do is to say to government, you know, 
and again, this is being selective, but in a city, the catchment area for a school is probably less than a kilometre because of the density of the population. So the, you can put pressure on government to say, well, surely that school must have cycle lanes to that school. You've only got to put in a kilometre. Come on. Mm -hmm. And that's much harder when you're in a rural area where the catchment area might be 15 miles. So we've got to get our foot in the door, get them to agree to it, and then it moves, and then it moves to the next stage, and then it becomes norm, and then they get to where they should get to, which is, of course, it should be national. But we've sort of got to be, unfortunately, realistic with where we are and take steps. So I totally concur, but give me another five years and then we'll be on the way. Now. Thanks. Alan, Caroline, is there anything you'd like to say on that, moving into rural areas? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, another question, gentlemen here in the suit jacket on the second row. Thank you. Yes, I am intrigued a little bit about the externalities of the of the scooters. I mean, this might apply to Lyft or Lime, and uh, I'm, I'm I've already from Sciences Po Paris, and in France, this has been a recurrent issue regarding uh, the charging procedures, the fact that these are done in a, in a very random, haphazard way, and sometimes utilizing means that are not very environmentally friendly. So how do you intend to factor that into your operations later on and eventually address what the future will bring as a more sustainable way of char recharging, also conveying these vehicles from one side to the other of the city that they are needed? Alan? Um, yeah, so the, what I'd probably say to that is that I think Paris is an example of was the big first kind of big international, one of the first big, big international boom cities for the kind of e-scooter trend. Um, and I think that brought with it a kind of set of circumstances and a kind of ways of competition and operating, which I think everyone who was involved in it would accept did not always deliver the best kind of necessary outcomes to the city. And I think the city world is kind of, you know, is um, obviously now developing that. I think you're around that quite a lot. The thing I'd say in direct response is you use the word haphazard, and for me, haphazard sounds like inefficiency. And so, from our business perspective, you know, we want to improve the way in which scooters are charged, the way in which they're put out, and the way in which they're managed, because every time something is haphazard or random or doesn't happen in the way we want it to, it's inefficiency on our business, and that's going to hurt our margins longer, longer term, right? So we're doing a lot of work, for example, at the moment about things like how can we make sure that um, you know scooters are deployed and collected by us or partners in a way in which you know it's very in a very controlled way, but also doing a lot of work around stuff like you touched on batteries and charging, in order to a lot of research work to try and make sure that the batteries that are going into a scooter are lasting way in excess of what they were lasting 12 months ago or 18 months ago, and the scooter itself is lasting much much longer. Again, because if a scooter lasts four months out on the street, it can only make us money for four months when people are hiring it. If it can last 12 months, then it can make money for 12 months. So we want 12 months. And so the goal should be quite aligned there. And I think you already, you've seen, you know, in the last six, 12 months, a lot of development in the industry. And I think in a lot of places now, you're seeing a much more controlled, much more managed approach. Although I would accept what you're saying before about kind of, you know, the way in which the industry is competed has been quite 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 fast and quite hard and therefore you know you would expect we're now in a period where improvements are coming I think. <laughs> no, I mean, I, what he said but I'll add um, we had a fellow just recently wrap up from the National Resources Defense Council uh, looking specifically at this the life cycle of our uh, light electric fleet um, so there's certainly policy work underway at Lyft to make sure that we're going to be leading on that. I think part of that is actually also the form factor. The scooters we see today being used are you know, ones you can buy on Amazon or wherever you would buy them, and um, they're, not, they're not built for shared use. Um, and so I think we, you know, we've been hard at work also um, you know, imagining and, and working on a, a, a new form factor that we can bring to market that would address some of the life cycle concerns. Um, the last thing I would add, I do think that um, the swappable batteries provide a lot of convenience, but I think the long-term solution for us is, is incorporating the electric um, charging into the stations themselves. Um, so electrifying those stations and building a network um, 
that makes use of, um, you know, when the, when the bikes or scooters are down, they're charging, um, and we don't have to sort of create new VMT to go out and swap those batteries, that, you know, like we're doing now. I just want to add one little thing there, because the scooter thing was something that came into our world in a way that I wasn't really expecting. It was another, I mean, OFO was one thing in those mm -hmm. guys, but the scooter's another. And, I, and, and I've been trying to get my head around how that fits into this world that, that, that we want. And my initial feeling was that it's probably not what we want. But that's what happens when you're, you're focusing on something new, you, you don't have a chance to get your head around it. So I've been mulling that over and I'm starting to come around to the idea that, that, that it has a role to play, and probably quite a positive role to play. I don't see that in most cities, the US is different because you still have a lot of car use, but in, certainly in Europe, there aren't so many people using cars in cities. The, the problem with the car is it's cluttering up the city. It's not being used much. There's only about less than 5% of people who are commuting daily because they'd be nuts to get nowhere. They're using this thing that's under the ground, which is useful and nice, but I think we could do a lot to encourage a few more people to come out of it every now and again and, and see that they live in this beautiful city. So I think scooters could play a really, really strong role in encouraging people out from under the ground to rediscover their city, to rediscover rain, to rediscover the seasons, to build confidence. And if we temper their capability, I think it may even encourage people and be a conduit to get people onto bikes. Because I think a scooter will deliver on the mental health, but as much as I go over it in my mind, doing this just isn't going to deal, deal with a physical problem. <laughs> so we really need to get more physical exercise. So I think if we, we work together, and this is where policy comes in, and you, you, you regulate, but in a positive way, you can create something that acts as a conduit, gets people back, they discover that there are the parks, there are the canals they didn't know about, the back streets that they'd forgotten all about existing. And maybe when all these bikes are whizzing past them, um, they decide that after a six to 12 months of that, they might want to get on a bike, and then they do the exercise, and then we're in jackpot zone. So it's going to be an interesting <coughs> Thank you. Now we've got time for just one more question. I'm going to ask the, the lady at the front here. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much. Isabel Clement, uh, director of a small charity here based in London called Wheels for Wellbeing. And we are turning out to be the voice of disabled people who cycle. And um, I mean, we're looking at what will the future of urban mobility look like at the moment. And I'm, my hope is that it will look like it will look a lot more diverse than it does now. And that's in my neck of the wood. It's about a lot more disabled people, older people being out and able to use their city because people are very isolated at the moment. And the, the clutter uh, uh, caused by cars is a huge uh, reason and then the quality of pavements is another. Now, you guys, micro-mobility, cycling, uh, we, are, we, are in, we are with you, except that a lot of disabled people are being used or are being against the, the, the improvements around micro-mobilities because they are a threat, they're a change, which may, current, which may uh, affect their use of cars, which currently they are forced to use. So my plea is to you guys to work with disability organisations which are fighting for the right of disabled people to be physically active and physically uh, actively mobile, uh, to work with us because we agree, the, the, back to the previous um, presentation, is we need to uh, take some of the space which is currently used by cars to build what we are calling mobility lanes. They're not cycle lanes, they're mobility lanes and then any of us who are moving faster than a pedestrian pet space can be safely on mobility lanes and pedestrians and older people and children can be safely on the pavements. We don't want to be mixing, but we want to be able to move. So my plea to you and my question is, will you work with us to push for a, a rethink uh, which will include the people who are currently fighting against you? So that's Um, I think, I think the, I think the general direction of travel is very much aligned with what you're aspiring for. 
Um, and I think that will be driven by the need for moving cargo. You know, if we're going to take and change our cities, then how we move stuff about is going to be really important. And there's been, a, again, you know, cargo bikes 10 years ago, would hard, no one even knew what, they didn't even know what the phrase was, um, most people. And now it's becoming synonymous. We've got government incentives for people to use cargo bikes. We've got DHL thinking about it. So there is this tremendous shift in thinking and policy and it isn't just about a cyclist, it is about, well, a cargo bike is cycle, but it's a different context, and potentially some of your community require a different context. So I think, and funny enough, that is even potentially jumping over what you might have in Northern Europe, which really was a cycling uh, infrastructure, actually into a, well, a different mobility infrastructure, if you put it that way. So. My feeling is, well, yes, we're, we're open-eared and we're, we're, we're happy to work. And funny enough, the, we have, I, I, well, it's not there, it's out there, but I, we've created an electric bike. And the whole, the very nascence of that idea came from one of our customers who was disabled and weak in his legs. And he, 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 he could get so far in his car and he needed something to get the last miles, but his legs weren't strong enough, so he couldn't pedal. So he rigged up this thing. It was entirely illegal and flipping dangerous, but it was very cool. And that turned out to be the inspiration for why we have our e-bike. So I, I think it's coming, and I think, I think it will come faster than you might, might, might suspect. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, really, really happy to, to have a chat about it. And, you know, we, I think we recognise that, again, we kind of come back to the point about being a relatively early stage industry, a relatively early stage company. We certainly are completely aware that we need to have all the help we can get from different types of organisations representing different parts of the community to make sure that the types of things we're developing and how we're operating, to be honest, in individual cities, because the challenges are obviously different. Um, you know, meets the meets the requirements and you know allows everyone to use the public space fairly. Um, whilst obviously hoping for us to be able to offer our products to people, so really really happy to have a discussion on it. I think um, on the sort of more more broad point about kind of mobility lanes, I think it's one of the things, uh, generally speaking, where we we think we can team up with kind of cycle associations and to be honest, anyone who uses a cycle lane, because what we see quite a lot is there are people, and it's a little bit like you were saying before about getting people out, getting people trying something new. There are people who look at a bike at the moment and a cycle lane in London and just go, that's not me, I don't do it, it's not, not, not what I'm about. But then very well may hop onto a scooter and try that out if it's something new they don't know whether or not they like. And as soon as they're on the scooter and in the cycle lane, all, all, all of a sudden they're going to notice when that cycle lane ends and they're going to notice what it's like to try and get around a roundabout on a scooter, on a bike with no protected lane. And in that, you can create another advocate for the types of things that we need. So I completely agree about the mobility lanes. It's something we're very interested in um, and something hopefully we can join a lot of people to, to make. Um, absolutely. Um, we have, we've actually formed this, this cool concept called, um, we call them mobility councils in the cities where we work, where we invite sort of expert stakeholders to join us in thinking about our impact on a city. So we'd love to tell you more about that after the event. Um, in some of the cities where we operate in the U.S., we actually have adaptive programs as well. Um, and so that, that's been something that has been increasingly important and, and something that we're working hard to sort of model out a, a good experience on. Um, I think sort of like going back to the point of this whole panel, uh, this notion of the impact that cars have on our cities, the sort of unhappiness, but also the ways that cars can break down social connection. I think one of the most sort of devastating impacts has been that Oftentimes, those that are not using the car end up sort of fighting amongst themselves for this scrap, the scraps of space, and, and that has left, um, you know, advocates like you at odds with perhaps cycling advocates, and that's something that we really have to repair if we're ever going to take the streets back um, and make and make them for people again. So, um, 100 percent in. <laughs> Thanks. So. We're running out of time now, so it's up. <laughs> I was just wondering if these companies like Lyft and Lion have enormous resources uh, financially, uh, and they also have common interests in uh, 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 creating infrastructure which is safe for cyclists, for micro mobility, and all. 
Would you be willing to uh, combine your enormous resources to promote safety for the greater good of the micromobility sector? Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> I think I don't know. You may know much more. You'll know much more, much, much better about North America than I do. But I mean, yes, is the answer. We do it already with, um, sorry, with other scooter companies in Europe. So. Um, just because it's the bit of Europe where I spend a lot of time, but in across Scandinavia, we just launched um, a new association, loftily called the Nordic Micro Mobility Association. So we've been very inventive with the title. Um, but there's us and um, a bunch of other European um, scooter companies, electric bike companies, um, some charging companies, associate members of that. And the idea is exactly as you say: is to bring people together and say, what do we need to work on together? Um, you know, can we run public education campaigns? Can we get Scooters occasionally end up in rivers and stuff in the pits of Europe. Can we get a company to go and fish the scooters out of the rivers and pay for that as a as industry because it's a positive thing to do? Um, so yeah, really, it's something we're we're doing already. Um, again, it's a newish industry, but nevertheless, we've taken the first couple of steps, I think, towards that, and hopefully, it'll bear more fruit. Yeah, yeah I assume it's just a bit of <laughs> Cool. Okay, so we're going to draw the session to close now. The communications professional in me loves a key message. So just by way of summing up, I'm going to ask each panellist just to very quickly give us two or three key points that they would like the audience to take away from this session. So starting with Will. Well, I hadn't prepared for that. I know it was on the bit of paper I read on the way here. But <laughs> <it's>, uh... <laughs> My thing is... I'm just repeating myself, but we have interesting people in this room who know interesting people, and uh, it is an overused sort of verb, but we have to create a movement, it needs to be global, and we need to use our influence, and not be too perfectionist about it, we just need to keep making things get better, bit by flipping bit and doing anything we can, anywhere we can, and it covers architecture, mobility, education, the whole bang shoot. And, and if we do that, and if we bother to turn up at events like this, and we care to, to share it with our friends, that momentum will grow. Um, because all the solutions are there. It's just about shifting slightly the way in which we live. Close, I see. <laughs> no, I, I think the, from my seat, the future of micromobility is, is, is going to be public-private partnership. Um, and we, we have to take space and we have to spend money um, at a much larger scale than we're doing so that we can actually have it compete with car use in a way that shifts, you know, shifts behavior for more people. And we have to make um, these systems more accessible. Um, so that more of the population can participate. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with both of those absolutely entirely. I think the, the only other thing that I would add as a kind of takeaway of it is from, from our perspective, you know, we need to start with the position of saying, well, is the technology and the transport mode going to be more positive than what, than what currently exists? If the answer to that is yes, when you're thinking about an electric bike or an electric scooter or any other form of mobility you might choose to think about, then we have to begin by thinking, okay, let's encourage this. We know it's going to come with externalities, we know it's going to come with challenges, but fundamentally we want this thing rather than what exists already. And I think if we go into that with that mindset, then it can help us think about what is appropriate ways to make sure that we can use space in the correct way whilst encouraging new and innovative forms of transport that ultimately will help us solve the problem. Um, I better add something, otherwise I'll be shot by the marketing team. We just launched a flipping campaign for Luma. It's sitting right in front of me. I forgot to mention a word about it. Bloody hell. Um, we, we've got 600,000 customers out there across 47 countries. We sell through 1,500 shops. So if you want to help us kick some ass, get stuck in. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone.